The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture to the first letter of John. It's 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. We'll read verses 9 through 13 this morning. 1 John chapter 5, beginning with verse 9, reading through verse 13. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. For this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Now, God, as we come to this time in worship when we listen for a word from you, we know, God, that even in our presence now there is Sorrow and grief at the loss of our dearly beloved Dolores. But Lord, we also know that in that grief and that sorrow is is joy. Joy, Lord, in the good news of you, our Lord and our Savior. So Lord, even as we are here this morning for worship, as we have gathered together, We pray, God, that we hear what you would have us to hear, or that we may do what you call us to do, so that we may be the people you call us to be. Speak to us now, Holy Spirit, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Testimonies. Words in here, I think, seven times. Testimony. I suppose many of you have been around church long enough to have heard one or two, maybe a dozen folks give their testimonies. For those of you who may be otherwise unaware, when someone gives their testimony, it's usually an autobiographical account of how he or she became a Christian, how they got saved, how they came to faith. Now, I've heard more than a few folks tell their testimonies, and it's been my experience that they fall into one of sort of three general groupings, three general categories. First, uh, there are those testimonies that follow a narrative that goes something like this. I was an awful kid. I was terrible my entire life. I was a drunk since the age of 12. Had a -a three-pack-a-day habit since I was nine. Spent the night in jail because I punched my middle school math teacher. You see where this is going, right? Usually so. I got spent the night in jail for robbing a Chevron when I was 14. But then, then I heard a television preacher like he was talking right to me. And so I prayed, got saved. Now my life's a gravy train with biscuit wheels. Married, got three nice kids, a house, two paid for cars. Hallelujah, ain't God good, right? That's one. The second sort is usually a lot milder, sometimes goes something like this. I've gone to church every day of my life, and even nine months before I was born, I was sitting in the pew with Mama. I could sing every VBS song by heart, got gold stars every week in Sunday school for memorizing my Bible verses, even sang in the children's choir, but I knew I was going to hell. And so... When I was seven, I said the sinner's prayer and walked the aisle and got baptized. And I've been a good Christian ever since. The third type, I think, falls somewhere in the middle. They go something like this. Well, I wasn't that bad a person. But I knew something was missing. Lost my job. My dog got ran over. My car got repossessed. Didn't get approved for a mortgage. So I found myself looking for an answer to what might have been out of place, what might have been missing from my life. 
And that's when a friend invited me to church. I got involved, accepted Christ, and I've been a part of the church ever since. It's been my experience. They usually fall in those three categories or somewhere along the spectrum. And now, I don't mean to make light of anybody's story. In fact, I think the most valuable resource we have is our story, our narrative, our testimony. I do, however, think that we're living in an era when our stories do not carry the weight they once did. We're living in a time marked perhaps most deeply by an overwhelming sense of skepticism and the desire not to hear somebody's story, but to find out which side of the fence they're on. I'm afraid we're not nearly as interested in each other's testimonies As we are interested in where we all stand on this or that issue, we are more concerned about what folks believe than trying to hear and understand the journey that brought them to where they are and why they believe what they believe. And maybe that's why folks don't like to tell their stories much anymore. Maybe that's why they don't like to give their testimonies much anymore. I mean, I know I'm not the only one. Maybe it's late at night, you're flipping through the television and the remote dies, the batteries die, and you land on some channel where there's a preacher in a suit holding a microphone up to some woman. She looks right into the camera and says, I I sowed a seed into the ministry for $1,000, and one day walked out to the mailbox, and there was a check for, guess what, $10,000. Another story about a man getting up out of a wheelchair, doesn't just walk, dances a jig before he gets knocked over by somebody flinging a sports coat at him. Three more stories just like it. I know you probably do the same thing I do. Even if the battery in the remote is dead, you get out of the bed, off the couch, walk over, and as you push the power button, go, yeah, right. We're skeptical. We don't believe that stuff. It's hard to believe, folks, these days when they tell you something. Like the time Anthony interrupted choir practice one Sunday night, he came looking for the pastor. He found me, unfortunately. Came in my office, told me about how his car was broken down just down the street. All he needed was $30 to go buy a belt at O'Reilly's Auto Parts and put on his car. I said, hey man, you lucked out. I used to be a mechanic. Used to be. I'm not anymore. Don't spread the rumor. When I asked him what kind of car he drove, he had to think about it for a minute. Anthony said, um, uh, uh, a Jeep. That's it. Yeah, I drive a Jeep. I said, what kind of belt do you need? Um, uh, a fan belt? I think that's what it is. I said, all right, man, well, I'll tell you what. We'll go, I can put it on for you. We'll go down there, and we'll get the belt, and I'll put it on the car for you. And all of a sudden, he didn't need the belt anymore. It's hard to believe folks in their stories these days. It doesn't matter if they're telling you a sob story in the gas station parking lot, trying to sell you a used Hyundai, or telling you about the ways that God has blessed them. It's just hard to believe people's stories, their testimony. Because we've been burned one too many times. Because we've been programmed to be suspicious and skeptical of everybody. And maybe... Maybe that's why there's some comfort in the first words of the text we've read this morning. If, the writer of John's letter says, if we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater. Maybe there's another way to say it. If you're a bit skeptical about the testimony of others, God's testimony is better. And you can trust it. It comes with a seal of approval. But what exactly, what exactly does the author of this letter mean when he says, the testimony of God? I can't imagine God giving a testimony, can you? Does God have a past of which we are unaware? Was God a drinker when he was a kid? Did God have some, what does it mean, the testimony of God? Did God have a Damascus Road experience? What's the testimony of God? Maybe there's more than one way to go about answering that question. I suppose one might be tempted to take what you might call a biblical approach to answering that question and say something like, well, you know, preacher, the Bible is the testimony of God. 
After all, we call it the Word of God, don't we? With a lowercase w. The Word of God, don't we? Is the Bible the testimony of God? If it is, there may be more than just a few holes in it, at least in the eyes of those outside of the faith. I mean, if the Bible is the only testimony of God, what do we do with all those places that don't make sense? What do we do with all those places that contradict each other or paint the picture of a God that inconsequentially slaughters thousands of men, women, children, and animals just because they happen to be living on somebody else's land? What do we do? If the Bible is the whole of God's testimony, then what do we do about those places, those stories in Scripture like Hosea, where God seems to approve of spousal abuse, of a husband raping and beating his wife and throwing her out in the woods just to teach Israel a lesson? What do we do with that? I have to tell you, while I love the Bible and I take it far too seriously to take it literally, I can't quite get settled with the entirety of the book as God's testimony, at least not God's only testimony. So maybe there's another way to answer the question. Maybe a more historical way to think about God's testimony. Maybe if we trace it through the covenants God makes with His people, through the Hebrew Scriptures of the Old Testament, we might find a more satisfactory way of thinking about God's testimony. Maybe God's testimony is found in His covenant with Abraham, in God's promise to preserve Abraham's people. Maybe. But if that's the case, God's got to have, going to have some explaining to do about all that persecution. You know what someone found, scratched, in one of the bunks, and I think it was... Auschwitz, maybe DeKalb, I can't remember now. They found it scratched on the wall. They said, if there is a God, if there is a God, he's going to have a lot of explaining to do to me. God's going to have to answer for a lot of that. So if that's the testimony, God's covenant with Abraham, his people have been through an awful lot. You know, when it comes down to it, if God's testimony is found in the way that God has coveted with people down through the centuries... I have to be honest with you, I don't think it's a very strong testimony. I mean, either God chooses some really sorry people and never gets it right, and they're always being corrected, or God simply doesn't live up to the contract. After time, after time, after time, people are pulled back and forth across their land and across their very humanity. So maybe, maybe that's not the best way to think about God's testimony. And it's not necessarily found in the history of God's relationship, His covenant, contract with God's people. Of course, phrases like the testimony of God lend themselves to a great deal of pondering among the giant theological minds of the church. Perhaps God's testimony is something found in the complex ideas of God's substance in relation to the salvific. You know, I don't even want to talk about that. That just bores me to tears. I almost put myself to sleep thinking about that kind of stuff. I don't think think God's testimony is found in the $5 words of theology. To tell the truth, I think the testimony of God is a lot fuller than that. It's a more complete version of those kinds of testimonies that stick with us. Those kinds of testimonies that are not told in three acts. I was this, then Jesus found me, now I'm this. I don't think it's the kind of testimony that's shared from the pulpit or told in a lifetime made-for-TV movie. No, God's testimony, according to the writer of this epistle, is found in flesh and bone and blood in the very presence of Jesus. Now, hear what I'm about to say. I don't necessarily mean that God's testimony is found in the provable historical accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. I'm not even saying that God's testimony is found in the retelling of Jesus' stories, of His death, His resurrection. After all, if Jesus was raised a hundred times, it doesn't mean a thing unless it does something to you. Unless it changes something deep down inside of you. So what I mean 
by God's testimony is found in the very presence of Jesus is that God's testimony is found in you. In you. It's a bit of a worn out expression, but it's true. The only Jesus some folks will ever meet is you. You are God's testimony. And I know this because I've experienced the testimony of God firsthand. Not by sitting in a pew and listening to someone tell me their stories, but by the countless, small, sometimes big, sometimes hidden ways that Christ has been shown to me through somebody else. Like the way I I used to walk to my mailbox every day before lunch in college. I'd always go down, uh, uh, if you've been there, the cafeteria's on the second floor, lunch, but the mailboxes were on the first floor. I'd walk, go to my mailbox before I went to lunch, and at least once a week, there'd be a small little envelope in there with a return address marked County Road 625, Enterprise, Alabama, 36330. Every week, I received at least one note from Ann Arrington. She was the organist at my home church. She lived at home with her adult sister, Rachel, who who had some some handicapped issues. There usually wasn't much to the note, sometimes a bit of oversharing about a doctor's visit or something like that. Just a word about how things were going at church, how Rachel was doing, how long her brother Frankie had been out riding his mule one day, that sort of thing. I found those notes not too long ago when we were moving one room for Cole to stay in one and for Carter to stay in the other. I found them in a shoebox I had saved from college. Testimony of God. I think about the woman who sat on the other side of the sanctuary from Anne, Frida Jones. I sometimes called her Aunt Frida. She was my eighth grade algebra teacher. I played baseball with two of her sons. She graduated high school with my dad, so she knew a thing or two about me and the kind of folks that I came from, but she didn't care. She was my first real Sunday school teacher, but the way she taught me how to quietly love and care for folks is a part of the testimony of God for me. You see, Aunt Frida, not only was she there, I remember when I was a small child and we went to the Peanut Festival in Dothan. Anybody else been to the Peanut Festival? Like three people? Right. We're all going to take... Yeah, I knew Amy had. I saw her back. All right, so we're all going to take a church trip down the peanut... Okay. Well, my mom had given me $5. She said, don't spend it all. Bring back the change. You know how much it takes to get in the gate at the peanut festival, at least back then? $5. There it went. All I got to do is watch everybody have fun. We went to eat afterwards. I just sat in the van, and Miss Frieda bought bought my supper. And then, every time I came home, when I was in college, when I was in seminary, as we were standing at the back of the church, you all know we hug and squall, all that sort of stuff. Aunt Frida would come and she'd give me a hug, and then she'd always find a way to slip a $20 bill into my pocket. She even did that after I was married and in seminary and working a job. And I said, Aunt Frida, I don't don't need this. I'm grown. You know, I'm grown. She said, hush, take Sally out somewhere for lunch. And I wanted to say, $20 ain't going to get it. (laughs) But that's part of the testimony of God. I think of all those people in my own life who've gone out of their way to show me that they care about me, those people who've listened to my story and not cared about where it wound up, to not care about what side of the fence I'm on, what things are going on, about just listening to me and my story, cared enough to hang around, Those people who secretly hold the weight of other people's worlds on their shoulders and still carry on with a joy and a love that can only come from a source that is beyond themselves. You see, God's testimony isn't found in words. Because words will fail. Words will let us down. Our biggest, happiest, most righteous words, even as true as they are to us, are pregnant with the possibility of being our biggest lies. Words will let us down. But life, love, flesh, bone, and blood, that sticks with you. So I'm convinced that God 
could have ripped open the sky at any point in history. Ripped it open, spoke in an audible voice for every person, man, woman, and child, and cow on the whole world to hear him and say, it's me, I'm here, I'm real, believe in me, this is your warning. Closed up the sky, and in two weeks' time, we'd be arguing about how much rain is going to happen. It wouldn't matter. It wouldn't have mattered a lick. God could have reached down, tapped all of us on the shoulder, whispered in our ear, said our name, and said, I'm here. Believe me. And we'd all carry on as if nothing happened. But instead, God came among us in flesh and bone and blood. God came among us to show us, not tell us, not say, all right, look, y'all, I came and here are a few words. Here's some things written down. I want you to carry these with you, memorize and learn how to do them, and this is the right way. No. He came with us to show us God's reckless love, his eternal love for us. So God's testimony, it's not only found in pages. It's not found in theology. It's not found in history. God's testimony is found in God's Son, Jesus, as Jesus lives in you. In the way that Jesus lives on in you and in me. In the way that Christ continually transforms your life more and more every day, leaving less and less of you behind and becoming more and more of who God is. So ask yourself today, Mother's Day is probably a fitting day for some of you, maybe not so much for the rest of us, but for some of you. But ask yourself today, where have you seen God's testimony in your life? What's his name? What's her name? Do you carry some notes in a shoebox? Maybe a ring on your finger? A song in your head? Where have you seen God's testimony in your life? And perhaps more importantly, how will you be God's testimony for someone else today? Let's pray together. Gracious God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, while we rejoice, God, in the ways that you speak to us through Holy Scripture, through lessons learned, through songs we sing, through prayers we pray, God, we are most thankful for the testimony of your love and grace in those who surround us even now. Lord, help us to show our thanksgiving and appreciation for those who have been your testimony to us. And God, give us the power, the grace, and the love to be your testimony to others. Holy God, speak to us now in this time. In whatever ways you are calling us, Lord, to move, may we be bold and courageous in such movement. Be with us, Lord Jesus, we pray in your holy name. Amen.